Right, so welcome everyone. Um, thank you for coming to the workshop, uh, which is a collaboration between Plant and Tayport, which is people learning about plants in Tayport, Nine Wells Community Garden, Strathkinnis Community Garden, and Yellow Wellows, Wellies Gardening. Um, my name is Helena, I'm from the Nine Wells Community Garden. Um, I'm chairing it and our presenters today are Bob Bilson from Strathkinnis Community Garden and Peter Christopher from Tayport Plant. Okay, and I'm going to hand over to Bob, if you're ready, and um, he's going to start with um, his, he's got lots of plants to show us, and then we'll move over to Peter. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks, Helena, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, th this this um, session really is a, a follow-on from Helena's uh, gardening for wildlife, um, where a few people were interested in meadows and wildflowers. So um, what Peter and I intend to do today is try and sort of take some of the mystique out of it, because it can be a little bit confusion, and really talk about the various different wildflower areas that you can do, both from a, just a really small scale, you can you can sow these in just in small tubs, or you can make them in a on, on a field farm a, a field scale, so a big scale. Um, so first thing to say really is um, wildflowers. You, a lot, a lot of, a lot of you, a lot of us have um, let our lawns and grasses grow long this year, and um, and just to see what goes up. So a good example of this would be in St Andrew's Botanic Gardens. Um, most of their lawns have just let um, the grass grow high and um, I've found quite a few wildflowers have come through. I even had orchids and uh, um, there was a, a really tall hellebarine which was really beautiful uh, flower. So, so you could do that. Um, al alternatively, you can sort of help by uh, maybe um, preparing the ground and sowing some some seeds. Um, so the, the first um, type of meadow I want to talk about is um, uh, annual meadows. So um, in Strathkinnis, we've in our uh, playport park along the high road, um, we worked with a council about eight years ago to pre prepare the ground and make a cornfield annual um, meadow. Um, cornfield annual, uh, the, these sort of meadows were, um, um, there were lots of them in the UK sort of 50, 60 years ago, but they're more or less died out now. They're great supporters of, um, of pollinators and wildlife. Um, so this quite, I'll just show you, um, I don't know, if, can you see this? How's that? How's that showing, Helena? Is that okay? Yeah, so that's good. Th this is uh, this is um, I picked these this morning from our um, our meadow in the vi uh, in, in 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 the village, and um, it's uh, we've, in there. We've got some poppies, obviously the red ones. We've got the yellow um, corn marigold and the blue cornflower, all, all in a beer glass. Right, so um, just ju just very quickly on how, how the ground was prepared here. Five council came along about eight years ago and they actually sprayed out the lawn to get rid of the, the, the grasses and, and, and any weeds. Um, Okay, many of us wouldn't want to do that now, but the preparation of ground is really important and um, and you'll need to prepare it, um, dig it, um, rake it, keep seeing what comes. If you start that now, um, you, you'd probably be in a position to to sow it in the uh, in, in the spring, in April time. Um, it, it's important to get a nice, level field there. Um, now after 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 the ground was prepared, 
and motivated. Um, we, in the village, we sowed the seed. We got the seed actually from Scotia seeds, who are um, the, they're, 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 they're the main Scottish company. Um, they're very helpful. If, if, if you're wondering about a project, speak to them. They're, they're absolutely excellent. Um, they're just a relatively small company and um, maybe don't have catalogues and things, but if you ring them, they'll be, they'll, 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 they'll be very, very helpful. So the seed was spur on this one was sowed in the spring and um, um, it grows quite quickly. You, you, you have a meadow by, by, by the sort of early summer. And, um, and then by about now, it starts to die back a bit. And, and then the council came in um, and cleared it and then rotivated it again in the winter and prepared it. And, and each year we, we sowed more seeds. But what we found is we, do, we don't need to sow the seeds anymore. There's, there are seeds in the, in, in, in the soil that comes up year after year. So there's, there's no, the spraying was a one-off and um, all they do now is rotivate it. It's really important for annuals that you actually um, um, sort of make, uh, rotivate the soil just to, just to disturb it before for the seeds to come up. So that, that's um, that, that, that's an annual me meadow. Um, we, uh, we sowed that at two grams per square meter. But there is another type of um, annual meadow, and it's called a pictorial, me pictorial meadow. And these are very, very popular. I believe Peter's done one. Um, if you go to Edinburgh Botanic Gardens, and if you look at some of the roundabouts around Edinburgh, they have these Victoria Meadows, um, they're 100% sort of seeds, there's no grasses in them. Um, and they, they were a result of work done at Sheffield University um, to determine the, the best ones. Now, the cornfield annuals are native seeds, these pictorial meadows, and they're actually grown in, in, in Angus. Pictorial meadows are, are come come from um, different European sources, are certainly not native, but they are, but they're a good way of, um, of having a really sort of uh, bright and colorful um, meadow. So, you know, there, there, there were choices here. Okay, um, I'm gonna go on to perennial meadows now and um, um, I've got a, a sort of, uh, just to show you, I've got a, a jug of ones from various parts of a village. I'll go over them individually. Um, perennial meadows, I'd say the ground needs to be prepared even more carefully. Um, it, it can be a little bit of a long process. If you want to kill all the weeds, you, you, do, you don't want the sort of a really nasty perennial weeds like docks and nettles and things. Um, you've got to get rid of them. You can even sort of dig them out um, now and then carry on through the winter and in the spring when more come up, carry on digging, get rid of them. You could cover them up, up with some fabric. Um, one of the uh, guys Rob from Falkland today is doing just that at the moment working with the council um, and that that would be a, an alternative way to, to use in space. Um, so ground preparation is really important. <coughs> um, the company I mentioned earlier Pictoria Meadows they do perennial mixes without grasses um, if you go down that route, um, it tends to be quite an expensive way of doing it because you sow these seeds um, um, at a quite a high high rate, sort of three grams per square meter. Uh, there's no grasses in there, and um, yeah, you, you'll get you'll get a good me meadow if your budget is there. That that, that may be a way w w way of going on. Um, 
but uh, many meadows tend to be you, you have 80 percent of um, quite fine grasses are mixed in with um, different um, um, perennial wild flowers um, some I did in the village I don't know if you can see this from the this is a Scotia seed packet. Can you see that, Helena? Can you hold it up a bit more? Yeah, that's it. Okay, so that's from Scotia seeds. That's Viper's Goop uh, Blue Gloss, which is a lovely perennial flower. I've got um, I've got one here somewhere. Is that showing up, Helena? Okay. So at Cypress Blue Gloss, um, that was on the packet there. Um, we've got um, um, I'll find it. I've got got some nap weed here. Okay, so this is a nap weed. Um, I've got some some tansy, um, which is a certainly a good pollinator. It tends to be a little bit invasive and goes everywhere, uh, runs everywhere. Um, and that's a, that's great greater nap weed. That okay, Helena. Could you bring it slightly closer? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so there's lots of things you can grow. Um, this is one you see quite often if you walk in um, in the countryside. Wound wart. Absolutely beautiful one. And. Um, well, initially, I, I I just bought small packets of seed and grew the seed on into little plants and then planted those out in a smallish perennial area. Um, I like saving seeds. Here's some um, different primula seeds. These are primroses and cowslips and oxlips, which I'll be sowing um I'll, I'll, I'll be sowing these in our wildflower areas um there's some poppy seeds that uh poppy seeds of so I, i've uh, saved and um this this one here is called yellow rattle which peter's going to talk about a little bit when we when we move on to him so you can buy the seeds, or you can you can actually go to um, these all from our different community areas, and you can save your own seeds. Um, that's quite a fun fun way of doing it. Um, the other companies now you you can get your perennial seeds from um, from Scotia Seeds. If you've got a large area, you can also go to other companies. I'm doing a project now on a quite a large um, um, meadow with 80% grasses, 20% seeds. And there's a company I, I'm dealing with called Cotswold Seeds in England, and they're really, really helpful. Um, it, if you have a, a grass mix with your perennial seeds and you're doing a large area, the cost are, are you know, reasonable rather than doing it 100% of the seeds i'll just read out one or two of the names on the on the list of this um this is the coastal mixture on this pro particular project and it's got a it's got about half a dozen really really lovely um not coarse grasses fine grasses and then it's got some um yellow rattle in lesser nutweed red campion bird's foot, bird's foot trefoil bladder campion ox oxide daisy that's a fairly common one. It can be a little bit invasive. Viper's blue gloss, kidney vetch, yarrow, sea campium, greater nutweed, devils. 
Okay, it's a long list, but um, if you've got a particular project, just speak to the seed suppliers. They're really, really helpful. Um, and there's lots of them about, uh, uh, um, lots of them around. Okay. Um, right. I, I'm just going to, I'll give Peter a little shout now because he's going to go off into the meadow and I'm just going to finish up by giving a little talk about a, um, a pollinating a bee, a bumblebee project we did. So I think Peter's going to nip off now and, and get ready for the next part. And I'm just going to talk for two or three minutes on this particular project, which was um, really interesting in our village. Okay, we've got a, um, in our primary school, they have an afternoon after school gardening club and um, they come along well in normal times at least um, they come along and do some gardening now they've been at school all day when they get along there but it's absolutely wild they're actually going crazy and um, so we give them some sort of uh, gardening projects some vigorous gardening projects um, but then um, on this bumblebee project after 10 minutes of vigorous gardening, we asked them all to, to sit down on the floor and we did a little um, bumblebee um, project. And um, this was uh, in conjunction with one of the universities um, in Coventry, actually. And um, there's an app that we got for our phone called Blooms for Bees. And you can still get that and it's brilliant. It, it's a free app. And it gives you a, a really good um, um, identification of the ma major native sort of bumblebees. There's 25 of them. And we got the kids sitting down, and um, it was quiet as anything. And for five minutes, we just observed bees. Um, we found five different ones, and we logged in which was the most common ones, which actually was the common carder was the, the, the one in our project that came out. And, and, the, and the kids after a while sort of um, really took to this and, and they were able to identify several different bum, bumblebees. Um, the most, this was in a little wildflower area in the school garden. And uh, the most popular flower that the bees went to was the, um, was the foxglove. And it was lovely to just to see these bees just calling in for foxgloves. Um, you can also, the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, they have a, a, a paper chart that you can buy for a couple of pounds. So that, that's just a little um, little project we're doing. I, I think if Peter's getting ready, is he? Can we hand over to him? Peter's ready. Hi, uh, hi Helena. Hi, everyone. Hi, hi. Yeah. Now, we've got Ali as well, the garden coordinator, the volunteer coordinator. And she's holding the brolly because it's blowing a hooli here. And uh, if you're getting wind noise on the mic at all, then I'll just cut it short. We'll go back to the polytunnel for the Q&A. But to begin with, here's the small area that we've got, which might in fact suit people who have just got an area of their garden that they cut the grass and they're thinking, ma, I'd rather have a biodiverse sward. So what we did with this particular area was stop cutting the grass and we got wildflower plugs. Now, this was really helpful because as Janice will uh, testify, the uh, plant group have done a fantastic job of making a wildflower meadow at the bottom of one of the streets in Tapor. So what I was able to do was go up dig up clumps, divide them, and put clumps of these plants in the sward itself. And you can do that by putting a fork in, getting a clump of plants, stuffing it in, and banging the hole shut again. And if you've got a project near you that has a wildflower perennial meadow, they'd probably be only too happy for you to help but cut it down, dig up a couple of clumps, so that will get you started with your perennial mix. For your uh, seedlings, now that's a different story altogether because the one thing that we didn't want to do here was to sow into the ground only to have it swamped completely by the rank grasses. 
And so we managed to get a supply of yellow hay rattle seeds. Now these can be quite expensive to buy. So if you know anyone who's actually growing them, they'd probably be quite happy for you to collect some. And then if you're talking about an area like this, this is much more than you'll need. And in fact, when I was raking back, we could see some of the uh, young seedlings just starting to germinate. It probably won't happen because we're filming. But part of the thing that you have to do to this particular kind of meadow is in the autumn, cut it hard back and take away all of the residue. Now that can go into a corner of the garden where it'll just naturally die back and uh, actually have a habitat for a while, uh, little mini beasts. If you are sowing the mix, then it's always really important to first of all, rigorously rake back after you've cut back, to expose the soil as much as possible. Here's some of the yellow hay flattle I was talking about. There's the seed heads, and then there's lots and lots of the little brown seeds here as well. So if you are sowing other things like Bob was mentioning from the uh, Scotia seeds mix, it's worthwhile just going along and flipping over a couple of turves like that and sowing the seed straight onto the soil. And that cuts down the uh, competition from the remaining plants that are in here and will give you a better success rate for your germination. The best time to do that, especially with the yellow hay rattle, is between now and November. The wildflower plugs you can continue doing during the winter months. Uh, but it makes, I'm hoping you're not just going to end up feeding the pigeons of course. So if you've got a problem with that, you can always put some netting over it. Right, um, I think that's as much of the practical as we can do for this afternoon. So I'm going to head back down to the polytunnel where we can do the Q&A. See you down there. That's great, thanks Peter. Right, so if anyone's got any questions um, that they'd like to address to our resident experts, um, you can either put your hand up, which is, or type H in the chat. It's probably easier because I'll have, actually have a chance to um, see you've got your hand up. And, um, and I can call on you to ask your question. I've got a question that I can ask. Um, you've mentioned your yellow rattle, um, but I don't think it, you, anyone actually, did anyone actually say the reason for adding? No, I've just thought about that on the way back, however. The yellow <laughs> rattle, <yeah. laughs> um, Yes, this wonderful stuff, the yellow hay rattle, it is a semi-parasite of the rank grasses. So the roots actually steal nutrients from the grasses roots and therefore suppress the grass. So it will still be there, but it's quite amazing the uh, difference it makes from before and after. The, the, the sward will not get higher than about six inches or so. And it enables the other plants, like uh, what I've got here, meadow cranes bill. Can you lift it up a bit? I can't see it. Sorry, meadow cranes bill. And we've got purple loose strife. And I think Bob mentioned it already. The hard heads or gnat weed. Your, your, your picture's on the other side. I think you're, you're holding it slightly away from the camera. Ah, okay. Yep, there you go. And then try some of this. It's great fun and wonderful for the goldfinches. Teasel. Now these will, these will self-seed all over the place and they're really quite a toughie, so they'll suppress other stuff too. So hopefully I've caught up with myself and um, we'll carry on. Okay, excellent. I've got a question, um, which is, um, I live in East Ayrshire, so the grass is really vigorous and lush. I'm looking at setting, about, setting up about a quarter of an acre of wildflower meadow. Do I need to strip out all the existing grass before sowing seeds? 
Um, Bob, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I'm just looking on on there. Everyone, it's it's not. It's in the private message, yeah. so you're not seeing it. Sorry. Yeah. No. Uh, okay. It's it. Uh, yeah. As I said, the preparation, particularly for the perennial meadows, is uh, absolutely critical, and um, and you really need to get a, a sterile seed bed established. Um, if you don't want to. Um, if you don't want to do, use any uh, herbicides, then um, you need to actually um, <laughs> you, you need actually to plow or de or rotivate the, this soil starting now, getting rid of all the all the coarse grasses and weeds. Um, allow allow them to to grow again in the over winter and into yeah. spring and keep oh, keep, yeah, doing, keep keep rid keep get, getting rid of those it. weeds or or as in in rob's case R rob who from falkland he's going to use some fabric to cover up um his uh his um his uh, grass and weeds and uh ju just to get to, to, to get a sterile area for seed sowing if you if is am i right in thinking if you've got a, if you're wanting a perennial meadow and if you don't mind taking lots of time you can just keep on cutting the grass and taking off the the grass clippings and introduce something like yellow well, rattle just to reduce it, the grass but it takes a, long, a, a lot longer yeah occasionally you, you get some really coarse goose grasses and um you know really coarse grasses which as peter said the yellow rattle will uh, as a parasite will will eventually sort of wear them down but um it's probably better to actually try and, if you've got those types of glasses, to remove them first. Um, you know, can I come in on that, Bob? Yeah. Um, yeah. If you're doing it on a larger scale than I just demonstrated, like I know we've got someone on the uh, our chat room who was wanting to do it on a slope, on a bigger scale. Uh, what we did, um, I was a head gardener for the National Trust for Scotland, and they were putting out golf course that came from the 1920s back in place so as part of my uh, input we made the roughs wildflower meadows on scales of acres and uh, well, obviously to do anything on that scale we had to come up with a solution and what we did was um, almost like rotivating we got a harrow on a tractor and grubbed up the ground with the harrow so it wasn't turning it over but it was making the brown earth available and then through conservation volunteers we managed to put it in as flower plugs plus the yellow hay rattle and scotia seed mix so if you're ever in the area go and have a look about May and June time it's uh, really quite pleasing and as Bob mentioned earlier you get things unexpected turning up like um, the orchids so from one scale to another, and I thought that the uh, harrowing was a, a, a good thing as well. But uh, your suggestion, Bob, about the uh, rotivator, um, mm. I find that if it's on unbroken ground, it tends to just dance about on top of it. Uh, and unless, you, you know, unless you've got a very powerful one and a very powerful person controlling it. Okay. But if you've got a friendly tra uh, farmer who can come in with a harrow and just grub it up a bit. Mm. I've got the next question is from Susie. Do you want to ask that one, Susie? Unmute yourself. Okay. Can you hear me then? Yes. Oh, thank goodness. I'm, I'm really rubbish at this and I've done so many of these as well. Um, my question was really it is a sort of a, about biodiversity and um, these pictorial meadows that you've spoken about look amazing. They're really, really pretty, but they're quite controversial as well because of the amount of non-native species that are in there. And I'm wondering what the, the sort of general consensus of opinion is. Um, at the moment, me and Poppy have been turning a corner of our garden into a wildlife garden. There is nothing that is not native in there. If there is, it's been housed out and put somewhere else. 
everything that's going in, we're going to do a mixture of seeds. And it's a special bumblebee mix. Um, there's a tiny bit of grass in there as well. And then I'm going to be transplanting all of our self-seeded wild plants that we've already got in the garden. Um, mm. So gloves, teasels, red campion and so on. And we've got a wee wildlife pond and everything. And the aim is to attract as much of our, you know, our own beastie back. What do we think about the value? of the pictorial meadow versus the the sort of the Scotia seeds mix, which are all indigenous as far yeah. as I'm aware. What do we think about that? Yeah, well I I I, I tend to think um along the lines that you do. I I'd prefer to do the um the native indigenous ones from Scotia and ones I've collected myself. Um I, I, I think it depends just what your aims are if you want something looking really pretty um and you've got you know the budget to pay for it then people do go for the pictorial meadow, meadows approach and uh particularly around edinburgh they've used that a lot but but no i i i i like to collect my own seeds and um go down the native seed route definitely it's just a preference but uh, people want to do different things and um i think um peter was saying um recently he did a project for someone who wanted a pictorial meadow and it turned out really well and they they really liked it but uh, there you go <laughs> thanks you're muted peter peter you're muted yeah that, that Pictorial Meadows was uh, on a, an amenity side of things. It was a, a new uh, community hub in Tayport here. The Larrick Centre had long, deep beds. So I planted that, obviously, to keep the costs down a bit, but also to add that pizzazz and um, wonderful entrance. Um, now, to be fair, there is a halfway house. You don't have to be totally native and or completely non-native. There is a halfway house. Um, so what I did, uh, we got a new car park built at the Hill of Tarvet Mansion House and um, I was left with this brown strip round the tarmac and wondering what to do with it. So we did put a wildflower mix down but also what we did was any of the plants that I know do well for bumblebees and seeds for finches and what have you so we put them in the grass sward as well. Now, <clears throat> things like uh, Astrantia and other members of the geranium family, which were just absolutely fantastic. Now, there was an exponent of this. It's nothing new. There was a Victorian gardener called William Robinson. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. But he was sick to death of the Victorian bedding schemes. And... Um, he used to go around and deliberately throw seeds into them and uh, expounded this idea of the using non-native plants in a naturalistic setting. And uh, the one thing that's the caveat is that sometimes foreign species can romp off into the wild and create an awful lot of um, problems. Uh, I think the Victorians did all the, the nasties for us already by introducing things like giant hogweed, Himalayan balsam, Japanese knotweed, um, just to name but a few. So, as I say, as long as you're not putting something brand new into a grass sward, it's not going to cause a problem. But if in doubt, ask somebody like Bob and myself, Helena, and uh, we'll see if we can give you a hand with that. I think the next question is from uh, Rod, who's been waiting patiently. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I had a wee chat with Bob in the, the small scale thing at the beginning there, and I talked to him previously. In Falkland, uh, the Visit Falkland organisation, uh, I've got a, a grant from uh, the War Memorial Trust to do various environmental projects around the village, and one of them is to plant a, a hedgerow meadow area of about 85 square metres at the new play park for uh, young people. It's pretty much for younger children by the burn in Falkland. It's surrounded uh, on one side by uh, an overgrown bramble nettle area, which is a good uh, 
wildlife habitat. Uh, we've asked Fife Council to help us out by clearing the area to some extent now, uh, before putting down fabric over winter and then sowing it in the spring. Uh, they've come back and said that they don't want to do that. Uh, the reason being that the brambles and nettles are a good wildlife habitat and it's on a slope. Now, I think they think we just want to plant some pretty flowers. We don't. Um, we want to have a, a wildlife friendly, uh, pollinator friendly area. And we've already done some research. We've been to Scotia Seeds. We've got a bit of a plan together. Uh, can you suggest any uh, arguments I can make back to the council to try and get them on board? We do have friendly farmers as well, actually, but um, have, can you think of any uh, arguments I can come back to the council with? Right, Rod, <clears throat> um, without seeing the area you're talking about, it'd be difficult to make a, a call on this one. Um, where about St Fortin do it? And I'll see if I can swing by sometime. Um, it's, it's down, there's a thing called the Bambley Burn. Uh, so, it's oh, also I've... called the Massey Burn. It's got a new play park for kids that only went up uh, less than a year ago. And uh, so you go along, you go down past the stag and turn left and walk so, along there. Right. For about a couple so, hundred metres. Is that near where Andrew McCarran used to live? Got no idea. It's next to where John Smith lives. He was the head gardener at the Falklands. Mm. Yeah, right. I think I know. I think she, well, the the Portuguese woman used to live in the cottage beside the bridge. So yes, that's if, you down, if you go down there and then turn left and walk along for two hundred meters, you'll come to the area. It's now a play park. Okay. Well, if you leave contact details, I'll get in touch with you and maybe meet up with you sometime. It's much easier to answer the question that way. That would be great. Brilliant. Um, okay, we have one more question. Um, is um, that I've got a, at the moment? You can still ask. We've got a teeny bit of time. Um, you can still ask, ask another question if you've got one. But Janice, um, you asking about animals? Oh, you're muted. I think Janice. Yeah, I think I'm watching. No. Yeah, I, I was just, I know this only work in certain areas, but somebody that had quite a large area that they want to 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 um, rewild, as it were, um, could use pigs or some sort of grazing animal to actually do the work for them, to reduce the grass length mm. and to disturb the soil enough to get seeds in, even just temporarily. I know it's not the solution for everywhere, but just thought I'd mention it. Because somebody seemed to have quite a big area. That... No, I think they good... use that a lot at Campbell, don't they? They use the pigs at Campbell for uh -huh. various yeah. things. Well, the other thing that we had was at Tarvet, we had the flying flock. Now, this is a, <laughs> is a um, Hebridean yeah. soy sheep that the White Scottish Wildlife Trust have for managing some of their meadows. So if you've got a big enough project, it might be worth um, finding out about that one. Do you have to have them grazing at a certain time of year or is it...? Um... They, well, obviously because it was going to be a golf course and there'd be balls flying about everywhere and these silly golfers <laughs> hitting balls of it. So anyway, what, what happened was that the flying flock came in in the autumn and overwintered. And the fact is, the, the soya sheep will eat anything. Uh, goats would be another good one, but they tend to be escape, escapologists, don't they? Um, yeah, so they kept them there until the late winter, early spring, and they gnawed the ground right down to the, the ground. They have cows as well at um, Tents Muir, don't they? Yeah, that's right. For the same sort of reason. I think that's to stop the scrub rather than, you know, to keep the wildflowers going. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I think we are five minutes so if anyone has a last question um, make yourself known by we each in the chat. Okay.
that might be everyone. I'll just remind, I think that that might be it all. Thank you very much for your, um, all Dr. that information that you've provided for us. Yes. So to sum up, what would you say was the one thing that you'd want everyone to take away from this? Or what, what's the most important sort of about making a meadow is, would you say it's deciding what kind you want or what need it has or? Well, mm -hmm. on you go, Bob. No, is he muted? Sorry. Um, just a second. No. Okay, I'll put, I'll put in my tuppence worth then. Um, I would probably say that uh, have a go, have a go at it. And hopefully one or two of these potential um, practical uh, ideas will, will match the area that you're trying to do. And if you're at all a bit reticent about having a go on a large scale, just even just a, a few square meters of area that you therefore don't have to cut if it's down to grass already. And I think you know Rod's example of uh, blocking out the light for a year will give you the time to think about it and um, uh, and gain more knowledge and maybe see some other um, examples of it to copy the ideas. Over to you, Bob. Yeah, I, th I think um, when you out walk in in the countryside, just see what um, what's grown and what you like, and um, and then try and try and introduce those plants that you like in, in into your own areas and and if you can sort of grow your own plants seeds um, seed sowing picking out and growing them on and then planting them out that, that that that's that that's all, all well and good but also keep your eye open for the things that just come in themselves they've always probably been there and um, just by a different sort of management they sort of reveal themselves mm -hmm. I think that there's, um, I think it's, it's quite important, isn't it, to remember to take off, if, if you've got an annual meadow, you need to take off the, the grass that you're cutting in autumn, isn't it? To well, make sure that you that, keep the nutrient levels quite low in the meadow so that they, the wildflowers yeah. can compete quite well with the grasses. That's in the perennial meadows. In the perennial meadows, yeah. In the perennial meadows. I mean, that, that's in, in the annual meadow, meadows, we actually, in the one in Strathcona, we don't do anything. And the council come up, all they do now is they come in the late winter and motivate it. And um, all, all the stuff from the previous year is still there, actually. And because the seeds all shake off. And um, you do get that uh, yellow, um, the yellow, uh, the, the mar core marigold um, predominating. So, um, every other year or so we, we sprinkle a few more poppy seeds in and cornflower seeds in. Um, yeah. yeah. I would just add to that and um, say that it's not a question of just doing it, seeding it and walking away, is it Bob? Because no. it does require a certain amount of management because if you see some of these uh, annual wildflower mixes that the council have done at the sides of roads on verges, yeah. After a few years, you start getting all the nasties like um, spear thistle moving in. And I have yeah. no idea if they rotivate it, they're just propagating the spear thistle. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe as a, a small area that will delight you and bring the bees in, but you've got to make sure every now and again you get a bit of winter management and take out those docks and take out anything else that you don't like. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. The, 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 the main, main weed we have to take out each year the, the thistles. We've got a lot, yeah. lot of thistles coming into, into our annual one. That's great everyone. Thank you so much for coming. So um, thank you everyone for joining in and thank you Peter and Bob for all that wonderful information. Thank we're you. hoping to have this, this has been recorded so we're hoping to have it online soon. Um, and it will look out look out for it on blogs on plant and on the nine wells community garden okay thanks everyone okay bye bye, bye. bye.